This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 5th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we are increasingly concerned the combination of some oil price recovery and the incoming federal rescue dollars will be enough to let the legislature dodge facing up to the state's fiscal situation yet again. Second, we take a look at what's going on with the Alaska economy. Most of it is challenging, but it's not as bad from an income perspective as one might think. Third, we discuss the importance of demonstrating support for SJR1, Senator Wilikowski's proposed constitutional amendment, at Friday's Senate Judiciary hearing. And now, Let's join Michael. We start off with Brad and uh, and the discussion of the weekly top three. Number one, which is the fear and the danger that we've been talking about here for the last few days is everybody starts looking at all this CARES Act money and this new ARP money that are coming that's coming down the pike. Billions and billions of dollars going out to the various states and everything else. Uh, and the fear that uh, the legislature is just going to use this money to kick the can down the road and move forward uh, with business as usual. Brad joins us now to discuss. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Michael. How are you doing? You know, I'm um, cautiously optimistic. I'm cautiously pessimistic. I'm somewhere in the middle right there. I, I don't know which way to go at this point. Um, I see all this money floating around, and I see everybody kind of rubbing their hands together and go, look, we don't have to – look, Ma, no work required – and uh, it's really troubling me. Michael, it, it is. Uh, we've seen statements by uh, Senator Machecki and others that they're really going to they're going to hit it this year. They're going to uh, deal with the hard issues. They're going to resolve the fiscal uh, 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 crisis we've been in. They're going to restructure uh, in a way that uh, that that has a permanence about it. And by the end, by, by the end of getting through this year, it'll all uh, all be solved. Uh, but I had a long conversation with somebody yesterday who's one of the best uh, legislative watchers that I know, um, and uh, and he kept saying, uh, uh, "Add up the dollars. Add up the do- look, look at the, the look at the dollars that are that are coming in, uh, and then look at what the result is." So I've spent you know spent the better part of yesterday. Uh, dealing with the dollars, looking at the dollars, and um, <laughs> and 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 from the standpoint of kicking kicking the can down the road, uh, it's concerning. We have uh, oil prices are up from uh, from the original uh, fall projection, uh, and and now uh, we're looking at about a 1.2 uh, uh, or so billion dollar deficit for um, FY22. That assumes that you use a a 50-50 POMV, uh, uh, calculate the PFD based upon POMV 50-50. And after you take that into account, uh, we have about a $1.2 billion deficit after the rise in oil prices, still a significant deficit. But then you you switch over and you look at the uh, American uh, rescue plan money that's coming in from the feds, and, um, and surprise, surprise, uh, it totals up to just about uh, just about that amount. Um, the state is going to get uh, uh, 1.02 uh, $1. billion uh, directly uh, from the feds. 
uh, plus an additional $112 million in capital funding. That's about $1.13 in money coming into the state. Um, and then uh, the schools uh, and the localities are going to get additional money. The localities are going to get about $230 million divided up amongst all of the localities. Um, and uh, K-12 through uh, is going to get about $360 million. So if you say that those dollars as as I do, if you say that those dollars coming from the feds uh, going to uh, the schools and going to the localities should should supplant uh, the dollars that otherwise would come from the state, in other in, in other words, use them, use those dollars coming from the feds to reduce the state's burden, uh, uh, current burden, uh, uh, you, you you end up with a situation in which you can balance this year's budget, uh, pay a, uh, a, a, a POMV 5050 uh, PFD, um, and, and make it out of the year uh, uh, fine. Now, there are a lot of caveats to that. Uh, the state's money it can be spent over two years, so if they decide to spread that over two years instead of focusing it, well, the state and locality money and the K-12 money can be spent over, over a longer period. So if you decide to allocate that uh, over a longer period, then uh, the, the benefit of it this year uh, falls. You have, a, uh, you have a, a deficit that shows back up. Right. Uh, but that deficit could be covered by PFD cuts. Um, and 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 get them out. You do what they've done before the last five years, uh, and get them out. Uh, get them out of Juno again, uh, without having to confront the, the harder issues if they just you know continue what they've done before. So it's 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 disheartening when you go through and disheartening in one sense when you go through and look at all of the federal dollars that are going to come in and the state's discretion. Uh, with those federal dollars and the ability to use those federal dollars to supplant some of the state's obligations for K-12 through and for local funding. Brad, sorry, we lost your call there. You were saying that uh, they could spread it out over two years, utilizing PFD cuts to uh, offset whatever deficit comes by splitting it. Uh, continue on from there. Well, yes, they, they, they could, but... Um, uh, uh, they they could also stack it all in in this year. Where, what I was saying from there is that some will argue that well, oil prices are recovering, so we're going to be fine. Uh, we're going to get out of this. Uh, the oil price uh, cavalry is coming over the hill. That's not true. That part's not true. When you look at the futures market uh, and and roll those prices into the budget, uh, we we still have huge debt. We're still facing huge deficits. Nine hundred million. Uh, next year, 700 million. The year following, 700 million. The year, the year following that, uh, an average over 10 years of seven of a 700 million dollar deficit uh, uh, in the budget using the futures market uh, uh, prices. Um, and so this is not this is not a long term. We're not we haven't gotten out of this long term. Uh, but the problem is, or the challenge is, or the the good news, bad news, or however you want to phrase it, is that with the uh, uh, rescue plan money, the federal rescue plan money. Uh, there, you could, you could, you can construct a path that they can get out of Juno this year uh, without without addressing the uh, the really hard issues. Um, that just kicks the can to next year, which is an election year, which is all sorts of problems. Um, uh, and and if they if they if they try to address that by by splitting. The federal money over this year and next year using PFD cuts to balance the budget uh, those two years. Conceivably, they can do it. That kicks the can down into FY, FY24 uh, uh, by the time we confront it then. I, 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 think that, I think the long and the short of it, Michael, is it's, it's concerning uh, that, <laughs> that, that we, may not, we may not be addressing uh, uh, the fiscal issues uh, yet again. The, the problem with the problem that we've run into with continuing to kick the can down the road is we have no savings left. So as we've discussed on the show before, we're out over the Grand Canyon on a high wire with no safety net sitting underneath us. Right. Um, and if we use the the, the federal money uh, to get us through this year, if we use if we use the federal money uh, to spread the federal money so as to get us through this year and next year, 
uh, all of a sudden we're out there in FY24 with the same problem uh, without having made any progress toward it. And as we've said on the show before, if we're going to use an alternative to PFD cuts uh, to address these issues, an alternative revenue source to PFD cuts, it takes at least a year uh, to get that in place. So we put ourselves out there. Uh, if we don't address it this year, if we don't address it uh, uh, in, in, in next year, which we won't because it's an election year, uh, we're, we're all of a sudden sitting out there in FY24 uh, with, uh, with no safety net, no savings, and not having put a replacement right. in place uh, and facing PFD cuts the, the remainder of the decade. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, you just mentioned uh, early on that, you know, there are people that are talking about making these changes. You know, we've got uh, Peter Machicki and, and Mike Schauer and, and uh, Ben Carpenter on the other side and Kevin McCabe and some of these other folks. But it seems like they are, although it, it, some in the majority, but it just seems like they are still in the minority overall, though. Uh, I mean, we could see that we could see it, the behavior, you know, even though the Senate is held by a Republican majority, those that have the purse strings in House in uh, Senate finance are more of the business as usual. We need to continue the way we're doing club. And, and I just don't see it. Uh, I just don't see the political will happening this year. I see it be, to be much more feasible that they take the money and run, so to speak. Yeah, I think it's aspirational. I think I think I, I mean, we've heard this from. Senate leadership in past years, when Kathy Diesel was 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 president of the Senate, um, and when Bryce was was Speaker of the House, we've heard we've heard all for the last several years that we're going to do it this year. We're going to face up to the issues. We're going to make the changes we need to make, and and we're going to uh, and we're going to you know get, get this get the ship righted and go forward from there. But we've had savings. So every year when it's come when push has come to shove and actually confronting these issues. Uh, it's been a combination of PFD cuts, uh, which is easy for them to do because they don't need the governor's buy-in, uh, uh, PFD cuts, and 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 using savings. Um, and and the and and the conversation yesterday, uh, when it was you know full of the money, the conversation yesterday was yeah theoretically with a combination of with a combination of uh, oil price recovery and. The American Rescue Plan funds, come, federal funds coming in, theoretically they can do it yet again. And as we've seen in past years, when it's theoretically possible, that's what they gravitate toward because um, they don't want to make the hard decisions. And and so I, I, I think when we hear these comments, a lot of these comments were early on before the American Rescue Plan uh, was, uh, was, was gelling together. Uh, and a lot of the comments were, well, we, we are now over the Grand Canyon. The wire has snapped. We don't have a safety net. We're going to have to do something about it. Uh, the, the, the dynamic that has changed here is in part the, the, the somewhat recovery in oil prices, but, but much more the, uh, the federal funds uh, that are going to be coming into the state. I'm concerned, again, you, I mean, you say it's aspirational, but, I mean, this is what – First of all, this is what Alaskans wanted. This is what we talked about during the uh, during the election. This is one of the big talking points during the election. And of course, payment of a full PFD is also uh, very important as well. And what we're seeing is more and more that uh, it just seems like this is really not as uh, as high a priority for some of the politicals that are down there. It, it seems again, it goes back to that protection of the public sector. Over the private sector is it seems to be the the long and the short of the plan. And as many people that want to, you know, that talk about wanting to uh, to to fix this and make this problem go away, we just the, the political will's just not there. And I don't know how to fix that problem. Yeah, you have to fix it district by district. And while some people do want, it, well, some districts did vote to fix it. Rob Myers uh, defeating John Coghill. Roger Holland defeating uh, Kathy Giesel, Tom McKay uh, defeating Chuck Kopp. Uh, while some districts do want to fix it, by and large, uh, you're not seeing representatives who feel, uh, legislators who feel that they're under the gun uh, to try to, to deal with this long term. You've seen uh, legislators who uh, have been reelected uh, 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 on the basis of having kicked the can down the road. So um, it's a it's a it's a total total state issue it's not an issue that that uh you know the 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 the, the electors in in rob myers's district or the voters in rob myers district or in roger holland's district 
uh, determine the outcome. It takes all of the all of the state legislators, to, and it takes the governor. I mean, the governor's been, as we discussed last week, the governor's part of the problem. He's not part of the solution. The governor's not pressing forward uh, with a total solution to this plan. He sort of gave up after after the 2019 session when he, you know, tried to do it with uh, with cuts only and 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 failed. Uh, and so the governor's not pressing for a total solution. He talks a good game, just like Machecki does, and does just like other legislators do. But but when push comes to shove, when it's you know, give me a real plan for how we get there. Give me a real plan for what these other revenues are. The governor's uh, uh, a wall. So uh, it's it's the top line is everybody says they want to get to a solution, but but the bottom line is as long as they can find a way around it. <laughs> <laughs> find a, find a way around it other other than uh, uh, that includes you know PFD cuts. They can still say they're giving a PFD, but but they cut the statutory PFD. As long as they can find a way around it, they're taking that way around the problem as opposed to as opposed to solving the problem. Right. And and and, and the issue here is the is what's intervened since the beginning of the session is the the federal American Rescue Plan and the huge number of dollars that are going to come in with that. Yep. Absolutely. Brad, we've had conversations, both you and I, with members of the uh, administration and others who basically said, well, the governor's waiting for the legislature to move forward or the governor is counting on this or counting on that. But there just doesn't seem to be any, you know, any coordination. Now, I heard last this last week uh, I made some inquiries on Thursday and Friday about this, and the governor apparently is starting now the conversation with uh, members of the minority in the legislature. But, I mean, we are two-thirds of the way through the session, and it's just starting to happen now. Why is it – I mean, how has it taken so long to get to this point to where, I mean, we sh- they should have been working hand-in-glove from the beginning. But it almost seems like in some ways there's this adversarial relationship between the administration and the minority that's supposed to be supporting him. Nobody wants to make a decision, Michael. I mean, uh, the governor doesn't. The, the governor isn't willing to use the political capital, and and you know, and he would say there isn't the political capital because he can't get sixteen. Uh, isn't willing to use the political capital make to deep to make the deep spending cuts to get us down to uh, get us down to traditional what spending that would be supported by traditional revenue levels. Um, the the governor doesn't, and and then the governor doesn't want to make a decision on what the other revenues are. I mean, his ten year plan admits. That that we have continuing deficits throughout the, the remainder of the decade. When you use uh, the current futures market prices for oil, it shows that we continue to have deficits throughout uh, uh, the remainder of the dec- decade. Uh, the governor's ten-year plan admits that we need other revenues, but he's not willing to step up and 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 articulate what those other right. revenues say. What they are, be. right? No, his his plan is here's a line item that says four four hundred million dollars in new their new cuts or revenues. You decide, <laughs> and 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 that's you know that's just not the way that the Alaska government is set up. I mean, the Alaska government is set up that the governor is supposed to, to propose uh, a balanced budget, um, uh, uh, and 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 he's not doing it. I mean, the he would argue he might argue that well, FY twenty two can take care of itself because you know I'm I'm using these these excess these ERA overdraws to, to balance the budget. But even he admits that in FY23, this, these deficits need new rev- – that we need new revenues. And and even the administration admits that it takes a year to set those up, uh, yet he's not proposing what they would be. Um, and, and, you know, the governor can say it's the legislature's responsibility. He's waiting on the legislature – but it's his responsibility. That's that's the way the Constitution and the statutes set it up. It's his responsibility to propose a balanced budget, and and you know and just you know having a line item that says other revenues <laughs> isn't isn't it. So I nobody wants to make a decision. I mean they're just sitting down there, everybody finger pointing at everybody else. The the minority um, uh, uh, is saying, Governor, you need to make these spending cuts. The governor saying, "I tried that before. And you guys didn't back me up, um, and and so we're just in this stalemate where nobody uh, is stepping in, uh, is stepping into the the vacuum uh, with uh, with with proposals, hard concrete proposals that would that would solve it." Uh, some one of the legislators said, "Well, that was a different legislature." 
that didn't back him up. Because, again, that was part of the problem was that he could not get the 16 to stand behind the cuts because it was all good, fine and well and good to cut government until, oh, no, you can't cut that. That's in my backyard. You know, uh, you can't cut that. That's my pet program. You can't cut that. My constituency would yell if you did that. And so he couldn't get to the 16. And then he ended up putting up at back even more to get the cuts that, it, you know, to get the, the you know, it, when it was all said and done, it meant nothing. He had $800 million worth of cuts proposed. They ended up cutting, what, $86 million, uh, most of which was reversed by the, by the supplemental budget anyway. I mean, it ended up being basically a, a zero-sum game. And and yet that's where we sit. Now we do have a different legislature, but does that mean that it's any better? Yeah, surely, and I don't know this for sure, but surely the administration has done a head count. Surely the administration has gone to these new legislators and said, Okay, I'm gonna if I cut, you know, this amount of money out of these places, will you back me up? Um and and surely they have done that. But but you you see hints of why that doesn't work, of why that doesn't come together. I mean, we had the, the DMV closings, right? Uh, we the, the, uh, the Commissioner of Administration proposed to, to, cut, to close a bunch of uh, DMVs. Now, the, the Bush protected their DMVs, but in the middle of all this, we had the Kenai delegation, uh, uh, Representative Vance and Representative uh, Carpenter, uh, re, uh, uh, objecting to closing the Homer uh, DMV. I understand there are good reasons for that. And I understand, you know, why they did it. But nonetheless, that was going to be a spending savings uh, that the administration had proposed through the commissioner of administration. And and even those legislators uh, right. uh, uh, bucked on those. Yeah. No, it's it's a it's a tough situation. I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking at this. And like you said, I think the bottom line is nobody wants to make the decision. Nobody wants to be the bad guy. Well, we could just wait for the whole thing to just hit the oscillating rotor and then nobody has to make that decision, I guess. But it's probably not the best way to handle it. So we were just talking about, uh, you know, this kicking the can down the road and what does that do? Meanwhile, we can see what's happening with the economy. Uh, the D- Daily News Miner had an article with uh, Musin Gutabi from the uh, uh, from ICER, the Institute for Socioeconomic Research at the university. And uh, the news was uh, not uh, not not too great. I mean, the economy still uh, slow and may not recover, or even start to see a recovery until 2022. Is some of the news that's out of that. Brad, give me some analysis here. Well, uh, great testimony, uh, great analysis last week from Musin uh, before uh, House Finance, I think it was, and. Uh, well, maybe before both House and Senate Finance, um, and uh, and a great analysis of, of where the economy is right now. Um, we are down uh, 22,000 jobs uh, from where we were uh, at the uh, at the start of COVID, uh, and Alaska, in some respects, has been has been hit harder uh, from this than uh, than a lot of other places. Uh, Alaska, you know, two thirds of Alaska's. Uh, 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 of Alaska's economic uh, base uh, is are from industries that have been hard hit. Oil, uh, certainly because of the drop in uh, drop in oil prices and the and the slow to recover investments, uh, oil related investments that have occurred uh, nationwide, but but also in Alaska, and then the leisure and hospitality sector, the the travel sector, the the vacation sector has been hit hard in Alaska. Uh, and while it's recovering, starting to recover elsewhere in the lower 48, uh, Alaska stays down and, and will continue to stay down, uh, in particular because of the, uh, the Canadian decision on, uh, on, on cruise ships uh, this summer. Right. Some indication of an uptick in, uh, in, in tourism uh, coming in by air. Uh, and Alaska's not going to come in by road because Canada remains closed to, uh, to road traffic. Uh, some indication of, uh, of of an uptick in tourism by air, but not anywhere near uh, the volume of tourism that we have uh, uh, when it comes up on cruise ship, and and it becomes much it, it becomes much um, more pinpointed when it comes in by air. It usually comes into uh, uh, the rail belt uh, as opposed to uh, southwest southeast Alaska. Uh, which uh, gets the the bulk of the benefit out of the cruise ship. So, while uh, the rail belt Alaska may uh, see an uptick in uh, tourism as a result of, of people coming in by air, uh, Southeast Alaska will continue to suffer because the cruise ships 
uh, aren't uh, aren't coming back. So, uh, a, a still a very um, a very difficult uh, economic picture um, throughout the state. Uh, more in southeast than elsewhere in the state, but uh, but but still uh, uh, statewide, still uh, significant effects. One interesting factor, though, um, and this is a this is a positive. Uh, uh, is that personal income, even though jobs are down, economic activity is down, personal income, uh, the amount of money uh, in, in people's pockets coming into Alaska households is up um, uh, pre, from, uh, from pre-COVID, uh, from the pre-COVID period. And the reason it's up is largely because of federal transfers. It is the combination of the stimulus checks, uh, that, uh, that started last year and have continued uh, in two additional tranches uh, uh, this fiscal year. Uh, there was the tranche in December and then the, the, tra- the $1,400 checks that, that came out uh, last month. Um, and combination of that and unemployment for those, uh, for those that, that were, have been affected by un- unemployment. And it's a combination of two unemployments. One is the, the normal state unemployment, uh, and then the feds have kicked in uh, uh, supplemental unemployment, uh, extended supplemental unemployment from the from the federal uh, side that has uh, that has helped stabilize the economy there. You add on top of that PPP, uh, the, the the loans to businesses that uh, that have been done in uh, several tranches now. Uh, that uh, that that's essentially Fed money coming into the state that's supporting uh, ongoing businesses. Uh, that turn into uh, uh, turn into grants as opposed to loans uh, if you meet uh, certain conditions. Uh, you add all that money that's come into the state uh, as a result of as a result of the federal uh, 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 recovery or the federal rescue uh, and and personal income. Uh, the income of, of Alaska households is up. So we've got we've got we got an economy that is. In a way, zombie-like. I mean, we've got an economy that is that is down on jobs, down on economic activity, but up on personal income. Uh, now, you, the 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 hope is, or the the government's belief is, federal government's belief is, once economic activity uh, opens back up, that the excess personal income will will float into the economy. People will feel comfortable spending again. They'll sort of spend down what evidently has gone into savings. Uh, because it's not gone into economic activity uh, and generate uh, sort of recovery economic activity uh, and and get us back to uh, get us back to normal, but it's um it, it's it's a it's a it's a two you have to understand it as a two phase uh, picture. One is jobs down, economic activity down, but personal income uh, personal income up. Well, and and I say I worry about that because once people get into a habit. They have a tendency not to, and then when they're worried about things, they have a tendency to hold on to that money as well. So now they've developed a habit of banking more of that money, of saving it, of not going out, not participating, and they're worried about another round of lockdowns or a COVID variant or something else. This could be stretched out for years, quite honestly. I mean, it, it just, could be. Yeah, it, it, it certainly could be. I, I, you know, there you you get all sorts of opinions on how fast. Alaska tourism will bounce back once the ships are, once we have ships, cruise ships back uh, in service. Uh, and some people say there's a lot of pent up demand. There's a lot of pent up money uh, from people wanting to, to take the cruises who will, you know, will flood the cruise ships and, and, uh, and, 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 right. But and it's all guesswork. Bounce back immediately, but there's no guarantee. Of that. Right. It's all guesswork at this point. I got about two and a half minutes, Brad. I do want to touch on SJR one. I know it's important. That's your number three. We've got to get out there and testify. Quickly talk about that. So Friday, there's a hearing before uh, Senate Judiciary uh, where they're taking public testimony on SJR one. SJR one is Senator Wilikowski's proposed uh, uh, constitutionalization of the permanent fund. It's not perfect. I, I have some issues with it. Others have other issues uh, uh, with it, but it is the game in town right now on the permanent fund. Um, a lot of legislators will say, well, you know, we've never really had uh, that much of a pushback uh, on uh, on our permanent fund cuts. 
uh, you know, maybe we maybe we're okay. Maybe we found the right balance continuing with uh, continuing with these cuts. Uh, S, the the public testimony on SJR one is an opportunity for the public to push back. Uh, hopefully, the phone lines will be full. Everybody listening, uh, if you're concerned about the PFD, try to call in if you can. Uh, but you also can send in written comments. Uh, look on the uh, uh, the PFD Defenders Facebook page for the information on that. Uh, you can also can send in written comments. The goal should be to flood uh, Senate Judiciary with as many comments, written and oral uh, and verbal, as as we possibly can, uh, to to push back on this narrative that you that you find in the legislature that people aren't that really concerned, aren't really that concerned about PFD cuts. You know, part of the problem is the people who are most affected are middle and lower income Alaska families who really don't have the time uh, uh, to uh, to to engage in that sort of activity. Just send in a one, just send in a one-liner email that says, "I support uh, SJR one." Right. Uh, that's all you have to do. Right. And I fully, f- I, I want my PFD back. That was the other thing. Oh man, uh, <laughs> Harold uh, says, "Why waste time testifying? They don't listen." Even Von Imhoff gets mad if too many testify. You know what? My goal in life is to make Natasha mad. That is my goal in life. I want to see so many people testify that she just rolls her eyes so hard that they get stuck there. That's what I want to see. Uh, you can't grow weary in well doing. That's what it's all. That's what it's all about. You've got to have your voice be heard, and this is important. And you're right, Brad. I've heard a couple people say, "Well, people aren't that upset about the PFD," and I'm like, "Are you not?" Apparently, we don't travel in the same circles because I know many people who are upset about the PFD and this action that says, "Oh, we can just you know, it doesn't matter. We'll just keep doing what we're doing." Uh, well, <clears throat> apparently, they didn't get the message from the last election cycle. Some of them did, but but you know you have Bert and Natasha. Natasha got reelected, uh, and they're saying, yeah. "Well, you know, we got reelected, so no problem." Um, it, th- this is the opportunity to push back. Um, it's the first opportunity. There may be others, but it's certainly the first and most important opportunity to to, to knock a hole in that narrative. So, hopefully, uh, people will do it. I I hope so as well. Let's touch briefly, real quickly here on the uh, digital yuan. Uh, China creating this. Now, I, I've been talking about this for a long time. Um, the uh, the China, the BRIC, Br- Brazil, Russia, India, China, they had tried to create kind of a breadbasket currency here about uh, 10, 12 years ago where they were there was some talk about creating some kind of breadbasket currency that could supplant the U.S. dollar as, as you know, or the petrodollar was another one that they talked about. Um, where they were looking to supplant the U.S. Uh, 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 dollar as the world reserve currency. Most people don't understand how that works, but this idea that somehow uh, now that they can get into the digital space and the crypto space and start creating a digital yuan, it is a challenge to America's dollar supremacy, which is, of course, always been one of the major dangers here. That That's one of the reasons why we've been able to prop up our financial system in the U.S. is because it is the world reserve currency. Give me your thought here on uh, on this digital uh, this digital yuan. Well, it is. It is uh, I mean, we've had challenges to the dollar before. The euro uh, is another example. The European currency is another example that people thought was going to you know, uh, undermine undermine the dollar. We've had challenges before. We've over, overcome those challenges. So it's easy to say, yeah, we'll work past this one too. But but this is this is entirely different. It is it is a disruptive uh, uh, technology, if you will, uh, to the to the dollar that some or many are comparing to Amazon's uh, disruption of the retail industry, uh, Uber's disruption of the of the taxi industry. And and they are they are saying that the digitization of currency uh, is has the ability uh, to do the same thing, um, and and you're exactly right. The, the a lot of our econ- a lot of the federal economy, uh, federal government uh, 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 fiscal approach is 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 predicated on the exceptional, extraordinary advantage that, that the U.S. has because of, uh, because of the U.S. dollar's role uh, in, uh, in, in the world economy, because of its role as a reserve currency. We can run these deficits that we've run. We can, we can uh, enjoy the low interest rate rates we've run because people just come to uh, – people are, are, are come to the dollar because that's what the, the world economy uh, is, sort of, is sort of based on. If the, if, if the Chinese or someone is able to find a way to undermine that, 
be disruptive to it in the same way Amazon has been to the retail industry uh, and Uber has been to the to the taxi industry. If the Chinese or someone are, is able to find a way to disrupt that through technology, through the digitization of currency, uh, America's uh, advantage, extraordinary advantage, uh, from its from a fiscal standpoint, uh, uh, declines rapidly, uh, uh, potentially evaporates. And 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 what we've seen as as a as a comfortable situation from a federal standpoint of running these deficits, running these debt because interest rates to the uh, the borrowings uh, uh, for the Treasury have been at such low low rates. Borrowings by the Treasury have been at such low, such low rates. Uh, if uh, if if the digitization of currency uh, 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 is able to undermine that, then you know we're talking about significant changes to our fiscal structure. We're talking about significantly higher interest payments, uh, significant burdens from. Uh, uh, from from the amount of uh, national debt that we've accumulated and the deficits that we've run, uh, and and a, and a substantial change then in 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 how we approach our fiscal structure, either well, increasing taxes or reducing spending, and not being able, yeah, exactly, and not being able to borrow anymore. I mean, that's the thing we're inflating and borrowing, uh, and we would be unable to do that. There would be no more votes on raising the debt ceiling. There would be no more because again. Uh, that th- that money would basically be coming due, and people would say, "Well, we're not going to allow you to inflate your currency anymore because we need to be paid back. Because if not, we'll trade in some other currency." I mean, this is the wheelbarrows of money for bread kind of situation. Yeah, it's not. It's not so much that we wouldn't be able to borrow. It's that we. It's that we would have to pay very high rates, exorbitantly high or much higher rates. I don't know if exorbitant is the right word, but much higher rates, interest rates than we're currently paying, um, and and so the cost. Of, of of government uh, would be would be increased substantially as a result of of higher of higher interest costs. I mean, we're already paying three hundred billion dollars a year in interest. Uh, that's a you know at a at a one percent interest rate. Uh, you just you know let's say we had to pay three percent. Let's say we had to pay four percent. Just multiply that three hundred billion dollars by uh, by whatever percent you want to apply, and and that's increased spending every year. Increased spending every year. Um, and and if we don't if we don't get it under control, additional increases in spending. People say it can't happen. I understand that. We've had challenges before the euro brick, as you're talking about. As you were talking about, we've had those challenges before. But 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 people are comparing this. People who understand these these issues are comparing it the, the potential disruption to Amazon uh, uh, in the retail market and to Uber in the in the taxi market, and and that's understandable. We see right, what right. technology did in those industries. All right, Brad. Well, we'll be watching it. Appreciate you coming on board. Thank you so much. As always, uh, great show for you today. Thank you for being part of it. Michael, as always, thanks uh, Thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keith, Lake Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.